All right, so I got a really great question, and I got it via text from an old coworker. Uh, he's actually a financial planner, but he's in management at a large company right now. So he, he's a certified financial planner. He took the same 10 hour board exam I took, and I trained him at our for, former firm about 15 years ago. So he's been licensed a long time. He's got a lot of experience. He worked at two separate firms. He worked at a retail firm where he worked directly with his own client. And then he worked for a large call center firm that he worked with clients that called in that belonged to the company he worked for. And then he moved up into management and he texted me yesterday. And his text was essentially, should I fund my pre-tax 401k or should I pay Roth? Should I pay the taxes and get into my Roth 401k? And he wanted a simple yes or no via text. Uh, but finances aren't that simple. You would think someone that sat for a 10 hour board exam would be able to figure it out. But you know, he hasn't practiced with clients in probably 10 years. So that's why he texted me. So here we go. The real question he had, and don't text me. I don't type with my thumbs. We're not, like, just call me. It's a phone. Send me an email. That's all perfectly acceptable. These are great questions. I love great questions. I'm not going to respond to a text. So the real question was maximize, how do we maximize the value of savings net of taxes? And I'd even say net of inflation, but we'll get to that. So this is as simply as I can communicate this concept and prove it. So he is currently at the top of the 22% bracket. So think about your income tax and your form 1040 as a measuring cup. Congress dictates how much of your income belongs to the US government. Your state has its own tax return and it takes its own slice. So his case, he was right at the top of the 22% bracket. And that's about 3% for the state. So 3% state, 22% Fed. Currently, you're allowed to put in 20,500, but those numbers change every year. So let's call it 20,000 to keep the math simple. And this math's gonna be a little dirty because it's, redu it's reductive, it's simplified for the understanding of the concept. So 3% state, 22% Fed, that's 25%. If he puts it into the pre-tax, he reduces his AGI and his taxable income, his TI. So his adjusted gross income and his taxable income goes down. He'll save $5,000 in taxes, which he will then have to pay later when he pulls the money out. He'll pay his taxes later. That's important, we'll come back to that. So if he puts it in pre-tax, he saves $20,000 or $5,000. So if he invests $20,000 for future use, $5,000 he gets directly as a tax savings immediately. That $5,000 is cash in the, pot, in the hand because you pre-tax this, if they withhold that five from your paycheck, it, it, this is real money. So five, of this 20,000, 5,000 of it would have gone to the Fed anyway, and the state. So if he wants to put it into his Roth instead, his Roth 401k, and pay taxes now and never again, He has to pay that taxes now. And then this 15,000 grows tax free, as long as he follows the rules, for the rest of his life, his spouse's wife, and the kids can even stretch it out tax free another 10 years after he passes. They could take it out, you know, the, the day before the 10 year anniversary of his death. That's current tax law. It's a lot of tax free growth. 
So, which is better? Well, which is better depends on what tax bracket you're going to be in later. If we assume he's going to be in the exact same tax bracket because he wants to maintain his current lifestyle, even though he's not working. That's a big assumption because we have to assume tax rates haven't changed. Fed rates haven't changed. The state rates haven't changed. This is a big assumption. But assuming that he's going to maintain that same lifestyle, it doesn't actually matter which one he does. The net net at the end of the day will be the same if you maintain the same tax bracket. So, if you're going down brackets, you should pay taxes later. If you're going up brackets because you're early in your career and you're going to grow your income and you're going to increase your lifestyle and you're going to get used to that higher lifestyle, well, that higher lifestyle can cost you more in taxes. So, in that case, pay taxes now while you're in the 25% bracket to avoid you know, the 37 plus 30% state, and that's actually closer to 5% state at that point. So better to pay 25% now instead of 42% later. Now, the question that everyone gets caught up on, and it does not matter, is, but the money is gonna grow. Yes, the portfolio is gonna grow according to your risk return uh, paradigm, you know, your uh, efficient frontier, but, the money in the IRA or the money in the Roth can be in the exact same types of investments. So your rate of return is irrelevant for this calculation. So, but let's walk through why. So let's say we average 10% going forward. If you get 10%, your money will actually double every 7.2 years. Let's go ahead and take inflation off of that. Let's call inflation 2.8% because it makes the math cleaner. So net of inflation, you earn 7.2%. Well, at 7.2%, your money doubles every 10 years. But if you get the same rate of return here or here, it's doubling. So if it's in your Roth in 10 years, net of inflation, you will have $30,000 in your Roth. If you put the 20 into your pre-tax account, the 20 also doubles in that same time period. So you have 40,000 in your pre-tax account. 40 is bigger than 30, but this 30 is tax-free. We netted out inflation, we netted out taxes. So now, let's say you wanna take this money and use it because you're retired. So we take this 40 out, we put it into the future tax 1040, your return that year. If you're still in that same bracket, let's take 25% off of that. You got 30,000 net of taxes, which is exactly the same. So there's some algebra behind this, but essentially the rate of return doesn't matter because it's the same in either type of account. You can have the same vehicle. The biggest, the, the prime question is what tax bracket are you in and what tax bracket are you trying to maintain in retirement? So for his specific case, with him and his wife, they actually started bumping up against the next bracket where you get all these strange phase outs where you don't get deductions for your children and you start losing all kinds of other stuff. So as we talked through it, we decided he and his wife should both max out their 401ks and for the two of them, it's actually 41,000. But to keep the math simple, let's stick with 40. So married couple, 40, 
it actually kept them out of the 24% bracket. So this goes up two. 27% of that. Check the math there. But essentially the whole 40 goes in, saves him a fat stack. Well, at 25%, that's 10 grand plus an extra 2% of 40 is 800. So my math is right, 800. I usually do these financial calculators on the phone I'm recording this in. So it's been a while since I've had to do middle math, but it's good to know I can still do it. So his immediate tax savings is 10,800. It actually pulled his AGI down enough that he qualifies to fund a Roth IRA directly. So he put in his 40, he and his wife. He's going to take the tax savings of 10,800 and he's gonna drop that in to a Roth IRA, which will grow tax-free. So he has, how old is he now? Let's say he's shooting for an early retirement. He's gonna retire in 20 years. So if we net out inflation, if we average 10%, which is perfectly reasonable, we've been killing that rate of return recently. We don't wanna assume it's gonna continue, but net of inflation, 7.2 seems reasonable. The average company right now is earning about 5% internally. If they get 2% growth plus inflation, this is a conservative assumption with the proper allocation. So, uh, this individual has a habit of moving around his target date funds, trying to time the market. So he's probably not gonna get that, but we'll see. He could get lucky and overshoot it. Uh, we don't do that. So we build the proper tool for your distance to your goal. The safest tool, the most over-engineered tool that will get you there safely and has contingency plans built in in case your goals change. So he's got 20 years. 7.2%, we know it's gonna double every 10 years. It'll double twice. So 40 turns to 80, 80 turns to 160. His 1080 doubles. Uh, I had to make it hard for myself. So that's 21, six, and then 40, 21, six. Forty-three two, yeah, that sounds right. So he's got forty-three two in his Roth, and that was just one year's contribution. So now he was in the twenty-four. That's where he saved himself from going into the twenty-four. In retirement, if he drops down into the twenty-two. So he's right at the top of that bracket again. If he gets close to nudging over, we have $43,000 we can pull out of his Roth to keep him from going up. That's flexibility. That's why this hybrid model works better. And we love flexibility. A good financial plan has a lot of contingencies and flexibility built into it because life gets weird and you never know what's gonna come your way. Uh, the Roth is also liquid before retirement, his principal is. You already pay taxes on the principal, you can take it back whenever you want. That's huge, that's huge flexibility. That keeps you out of a 10% penalty or having to pay this one back if you take a loan or do some of the other contingency plans that we built into all of our comprehensive plans. So this is what he should do, and you can see why I couldn't respond to him in a text. And not just because I refused to type with my thumb. That is not why we evolved opposable thumbs or devolved the phone into a poor typewriter. So in retirement, he's going to get some social security. Currently 15% that's tax free. So that helps pull him down brackets. Then we can pull money out of the pre-tax account to fill up his lower brackets. Once we, I mean, technically, we could get to the top of the 12% bracket and then keep him out of the 22% bracket by pulling the extra income he needs out of the tax-free account. 
It also avoids Medicare penalties and all kinds of other stuff that happens in retirement. It's also a way to keep someone's AGI under those magic limits where you get stimulus checks and stuff. So we, we had a lot of success modifying adjusted gross income to reduce taxes and receive other benefits. A good comprehensive plan can do a lot of that without adding any risk or any volatility to your net net value of that dollar you invested. So, a lot of math. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and if you think about it, if he was in the 24 and we actually pumped enough of the tax refund into his Roth that we're able to keep him in the 12% and we we're currently doing this for dozens of clients who we've been running their plans for, you know, 15 years or more. I guess I've been doing this almost 20 years now. Most of those original clients, because of these strategies and efficiencies that we built into their plan, are two or three times over their initial goal, which makes me so thankful that we pumped so much money into Roth. Because if their initial goal was here, and suddenly we're here, oh, thank God we've got that tax-free Roth money because we're in a higher bracket than we ever expected to be in. So having this diversity between your taxable and tax-free dollars is magic. It's flexible. Magic isn't what you think it is. Magic is the octant of hard work, good plan, and sometimes good time. If you get all three of those, that's magic. So an octant is a, it's a cube on an XYZ grid. Different video. I've got blocks to explain it. Uh, my four and seven year old understand octants. They help me draw on the blocks. They're in the office. So if we kept him out of the 22% bracket, same scenario. So we know he saved 27 and he's going to pay 15. So how it works out is 12% is his clear tax savings. I'm not gonna explain all the math behind this, but the simple dirty math is he was gonna pay 27%, now he's paying 12. And the Roth money that grew tax-free also benefits very similarly to the tax-deferred money. The only thing that matters, your time doesn't matter, your rate of return doesn't matter for this decision. What matters is what bracket are you in now and what bracket are you gonna be in later? And then we can figure out the net tax savings of a better strategy, what we do. I mean, I can do it in my head because I've been doing it long enough, but we have software that can do it and that can prove beyond a doubt that it's the right plan even calculate your probabilities of success on a Monte Carlo. It's very slick. And we allow our clients to drive the software if they want. We don't let them run their own reports because sometimes they miss a prime variable. So hopefully that's been helpful. And hopefully my old friend takes my advice. So I've been giving him similar advice for about 15 years. So maybe now's the time he takes it. He, uh, he even joked, he's like, you know, his parents work with me, and he's like, maybe uh, when, he, when he gave up clients, he sent his parents my way. But he said, maybe I should start paying you for all this advice. And I said, yeah, that's probably a pretty good idea. Like, if you want to use our software, I can charge you a subscription. And stop trying to time the market. Timing's difficult. You got to be right when you get out. You got to be right when you get back in. If you have a good plan and you do the work, you just have to be patient. If you're patient long enough, there will be periods of time where you're lucky and periods of time where you're unlucky. So if you can catch one of those periods of time where you're lucky and tweak your plan, magic. If you can adjust your plan during one of those periods of time, which we're going through right now, where the market looks very unlucky, we can bounce bigger off the bottom. That also ends you up in the octant magic. 
hard work, good plan, work the plan, and look for lucky opportunities. Octane of magic. Thank you.